So these are the things that I deal with. And as a child, you don't see racism. As a child, you don't understand and why should you? But for me and my organisation, seeing the disparity between how white, black and Asian children are treated, particularly young males, that's the reason why I'm so busy. Because it can't just be that every child from London to Leeds is badly behaved. There's a problem with industry, individual discrimination. Um, and sometimes it's sometimes children are naughty, don't get me wrong. But that's called learning. So, but they're not given that opportunity to say that they're learning. They're bad. They're aggressive. You know, some of the things that you see have been written about, about these children, you never believe that you're talking about someone who's only 12 years old. You think that you're talking about a violent, aggressive, some of them are called um, predators, you know, sexually violent. And, you know, it's, it's just out of order. So in a nutshell, that's who I am and what I do. My background is business, but I've become a huge part of the community and doing this work unapologetically um, and just calling it out as what it is. Yes, you definitely are doing that. I, mean, I must say you're doing an absolutely superb job and so many parents must be seriously grateful to you and the support that you give them and children as well. So I'd like to ask you, Cheryl, um, well, I'd like to ask all of you, but I'll start off with Cheryl since she's introduced herself there. How did you feel when you um, first saw the video of the police officer, Derek Chauvin, leaning, kneeling, sorry, on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. What went through your mind when you watched that video? What went through my mind was, here we go again. It didn't shock me. It doesn't, these things don't shock me anymore. Uh, that's my reality. They, I'm not shocked by this sort of thing anymore because this is what happens. What about, like, this is one that was caught on video. My thing is, what about all the ones that aren't caught on video? Because this is happening every single day to black men and black women across the world, not just in America. It happens here in the UK as well. Young black men being strangulated within prison cells and they've been accused of hanging themselves. This is happening every day. My thing comes more than our reactive response. It should be a systemic, systematical response by way of breaking down the barriers where the law is concerned and getting those that are corrupt within our governance and that's right across the board removed and all the laws being utilised properly. I know in this country, we're in the UK, and we see these things, we see what's going on in America, and I see the riot, and I see the anger. But one thing I do feel is that if it's three, four, or five weeks, everyone's going to get back to their lives. This will be yet another year when we see this, and it's forgotten again, we all go back to doing what we've done before, and nothing will have changed. My thing is, what are we going to do collectively, white, black, pink, green, or yellow, to actually stop this systematically and demand for law changes, and not just law changes, but making sure that those laws are actually adhered to. Because we know in the court system is just there to make money and there is a lot of corruption. We know in the police system there is a lot of corruption and racism. We just know systematically there's a lot of problems. How do we, white, black, pink, and green, now challenge this and actually be successful in actually doing something about it? Because, like I said already, we've got Sandra Bland, we've got Mark Dunn, we've got all of these names that we can ring up for weeks and weeks on end. Think for weeks on end, but it doesn't change the law. We've allegedly got the Human Rights Act, we're watching that being eroded before our very eyes. We've allegedly got the Discrimination Act, which is, again, how many people have successfully been able to do anything around discrimination, even if someone's called you the N word or spat in your face because your skin is darker or lighter? When you try and take that to court to prove that case, it's almost impossible. And it's, I believe it's been designed that way on purpose so that those cases can't be brought. Just like the fact that legal aid no longer exists in the UK, almost. The criminal legal aid is just about there. But for most other cases, there's no legal aid. So how do parents who are earning £11 an hour before the solicitor who charges £1,500 just to read your case? Yes, yes, I totally agree with everything that you've just said there. And you've also given me, and I'm sure everybody else who's on the call, many things to think about. Okay, hey, Tamara, so I'd like you to um, please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you do. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Tyrone Davis Huggin. I'm a 20 year old self appointed ambassador for young people in Croydon. Um, basically, what I do is, I my main goal is just to empower people to understand that they have limitless capabilities. And I feel like the education system and the system that we pass through as you grow up kind of just adds a lot of barriers to young people's lives. 
and it kind of dictates you, um, basically your demographic that where you come from. And you're kind of open to only selective things that you're able to achieve based on where you come from, whereas it's really not that. It's really and truly whatever you strive to achieve, and if you match that work ethic, you can really achieve whatever you want to. And I don't think that's taught or stressed enough to young people, so I feel like self-belief is quite low. And therefore, outworks is quite low for my young people. And I feel like generations are looking down on us like we're not really achieving and we're not really maximising our capabilities, if I'm honest. So what I do basically is I found that young people's interests weren't being matched with the opportunities that they was also being introduced to. Um, and that started from me being in sixth form. I had a work coach. I know when they have like a, a sixth form careers path leader, like, where they would help you say whether you go to university or what apprenticeship you take. And it was like, there's only so like limited options for what I'd want to do. And I was an achiever. I did A-level economics, business and media. But it was like the things that I was interested in doing, there was no kind of relevant pathways for me to choose that. It was more so just kind of dictated to well, go to university and study this if you want to do this. And I, I wasn't really down for that because I could see how if that's not where my passions are, I'm not going to give it a hundred. So it would just end up being a waste of time. So what I kind of didn't understand was what genuinely was the barrier. I didn't understand what it was. So I started going out there, speaking to young people, which were just my friends, and finding out what their interests were, like what they wanted to do with their lives. And then just finding out who are employers or who are businesses who offered relevant opportunities. So... If I had friends I went to do construction, one of my clients at one point was Conway and they had like a new season of 100 times apprenticeship. And they had like a new season of 100 times apprenticeship that would come up. But these apprenticeships were marketed in schools that I was going to, for example. So I was seeing that opportunities were very much out there. They just weren't being effectively marketed towards different demographics. So that's what I kind of decided to do, to just get opportunities from construction to IT anything really and truly that young people are interested in and just finding something that's relevant so that they don't do something that they're not passionate about and then divert them to maybe condoning antisocial behaviour or something like that. Well, that sounds absolutely amazing. I'd like to ask you the same question that I presented to Cheryl. How did you feel when you watched the video of the police officer Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes? What went through your mind at that time? Exactly what was just said. Here we go again. My, my main concern was that at 20 years old, yeah, I don't understand why I'm so already, I'm not surprised. At 20 years old, I'm seeing something like this and it's not a shock to me. I'm not, oh my God, what's going on? I'm like, that's just another day really and truly. Like, I, I feel like, I thought about this previously, I thought there's some people who live in the suburbs of Hollywood who never really have a fight in their whole entire life. We're coming from a demographic where we can see an officer with his knee on somebody's neck and then even still record it and not even try it. Like, we're, this is a sign of, it must be a sign of kind of oppression because how can somebody lawfully be doing that? And us as, as civilians, we can't intervene and, and say, well, you're actually killing a man, like, is that there's fear mongering because if another human was doing that i'm sure like without a uniform i'm sure maybe the community would have intervened or something but yeah. the fact that there's police and this is supposed to be police police in the community but then the community can't intervene to save the community that then what is the police and i don't understand yeah. um so i i was just a bit confused and it was it was mad because this morning I was watching, you know, like road cops, how they have like motorway cops and stuff like that. I watched some of them shows and stuff in the morning. There was a police officer pulled over the man and they arrested the man, put him on his on, on the floor, um, on his chest. And they had his knee on his back. And the man said, oh, my back, my back. The police immediately lifted up the white man and put him to sit down on the curb. You understand what I'm saying? So I don't get it. This The procedures have been exercised in front of my face. So why is the procedures not being exercised when it's coming to a black man? I don't understand. Yeah. So I was just, I was feeling like it's all good seeing that people, the unity and people standing up now and saying we're going to make a noise about it. But I even went to the protests in London and it's good that we're making a noise and we're protesting. But I just wanted to see, like, I felt like there was like a lack of leadership. Like what are we protesting for? Because as it's happened before, we protested, we make a noise. But what are we demanding for? We're saying Black Lives Matter, but now what? Are we calling out for, like, are we calling out for a tweet from the Prime Minister to say da-da-da? Are we 
calling for laws to change, we're calling for, what we're just chanting and making a noise. So yeah. I feel like we need to just recoup and see what from this have we learned, what is exactly that we want changed, and then step out on ready to actually say this is what we want and know what exactly what is that we want so we know when we are protesting whether our protests are successful or not because there'll be results yes. but at this moment we're protesting and making a noise and everybody gets it black lives matter at this moment and this moment in time but i'm not too sure that it's not going to happen again if i'm honest with you i can't yeah. confidently say that yeah I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, even the young girl, I think she's 16 years old, uh, Darnella Frazier, who filmed the incident, she's now facing a lot of abuse online from people saying, well, why did you film it and why didn't you intervene? Well, I think we should be you know, grateful for the fact that it's been caught on film and it's that film that's been you know, able to succeed in getting these officers charged along with the protests. So uh, I definitely agree with what you said there. And also, the, you know, um, the way that people are being treated differently for their crimes based on their skin colour. I mean, you have that guy, I forgot his name now, who went into the church in Charleston and shot dead nine churchgoers and then they took him to Burger King afterwards. Absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. outrageous. It's just yeah. <laughs> unbelievable, to be honest. So, yeah, you definitely pointed out some good, um, well, some very meaningful situations there. Uh, Maya, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself next, please. Maya is the youngest here on the panel. She's 16 years old and she is a witness to the movement. Hey, Maya. Um, hi, I'm Maya. I'm 16 and I'm a student at the moment. Obviously, I'm not going to school because of Corona, but I am a first-hand witness of the movement, like for um, people of my age. So. I am actively participating in a couple movements on social media and I can see as a young girl of 16 the effect that it's having on all of my friends and the movements that everyone of my age are taking and how it really is affecting um, the younger generations and it's just really been called to my attention that um, I feel like racism is a problem that we are living in and we have been living in for so long and how it still shocks me to this day that I feel like we are living in history and I've been reading this book and it said that those groups who have been privileged in the past are likely to be privileged again and those groups who have been victimised in the past are likely to be victimised yet again and that's why I feel it's happening right now and I don't think it's okay or permissible that the system, police, that is designed to protect society is the system in which so many people fear and it does disgust me. Like it, it makes me feel like ashamed to be part of humanity that feels that they can't stick up. So I know that girl who recorded George Floyd, maybe the reason that she was um, recording and not intervening was out of sheer fear because it's just, I don't know, it just, it baffles me how it is designed to protect, but in reality it is the very thing that does end up kill, like killing a lot of people. So yeah, that is just my point of view and I'm just here to educate myself, educate my friends, read about it and just honestly re like reprogram a lot of my friends' like beliefs and thoughts because I know that at my age everyone's very impressionable and everyone is just going to consume everything that's around them, the media, everyone believes it because we're so young, our brains are still developing, everything that we hear and we see from the media we are going to take it in and I am very, very lucky to be able to go to a private school but I am still very ashamed of some of the people who sit on my table because some people are super ignorant and they just don't realise that in the world that we're in right now everyone is equal. I do believe that racism is honestly just a system of programming and I believe that no one is born racist you are born and you love everyone and everything that you know and believe in and say and do is based on what you've been taught because we are people we learn from experience from what we do from what we see from what we learn and if you have a household where you are taught that do you know what you are better than him like no he's no you are going to think okay yeah that's normal just as you're taught to say please and thank you that's normal that is the way of life saying oh 
no, I'm better than him. That is also a way of life for many people. And I do believe that you're not responsible for the house that you grow up in. And if you grow up in a racial household, that's not your responsibility. Like you're not responsible for that, but it is your responsibility to realise that you are racist and that that has been programmed into your head. Even if you think, no, I'm not racist, you might still have those um, implicit biases where you do think, oh, like, oh, I don't really want to be friends with him because, you know, like, my family wouldn't want him. That in itself is racist. So it is indeed your responsibility, even if you have grown up in a racist household, that's not your, it's not your choice. It is your choice to educate yourself and to unlearn what you've been taught and to relearn. So that's honestly what I'm just trying to do. I'm just trying to help my friends and just everyone. I'm just trying to realise and unlearn and relearn and teach myself and see how I can teach others. And by being on here, I just feel like I'm educating myself more. And from this, I will read more, I'll learn more, I'll tell my friends more, I'll tell their parents. And just from then onwards, it takes one person, I believe, to change a group. Group to change society, society to change the world. So that's essentially what I'm just trying to do. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, I must say that um, I definitely pick up on your point of um, growing up in a racial household and then there being ignorance and, um, you know, you feeling like um, it's the duty of young people to educate certain, like, older people, for example, about racist situations. I know there was a teenage girl who um, was speaking about, she was speaking to her dad, I think, it's made it viral on a video where she's actually educating her dad and she's saying, well, you're ignorant, you know, you think this and that about black people, but they're actually being oppressed. And, you know, she really goes into it and back and forth with him. And yeah, like I said, it has made it viral. Um, I don't know, have you seen that video yet? I feel like I have. Is she brushing her teeth or something and her dad's in the background? I'm not really sure. I've seen a video though, similar to that where her Okay, because her mother was also involved as well. And it's like they were kind of not ganging up on her, but they definitely had a difference of opinion. And the mother and father thought one way about black people. And then this young teenage white girl, you know, she's trying to educate her parents on the reality of the situation, but they're just not listening. And they're telling her that she doesn't understand. And, you know, it's quite a bit of back and forth and it does go on for quite a while. And um, I've got to take my hat off to her actually, because, she, you know, is going against her family there, that's her parents. And um, she's trying to teach them, you know, what black people go through and all about the um, injustice that many uh, black people face, especially when it has to do with the brutality of um, the police mistreating them. So um, that, that came into my mind when you mentioned uh, the ignorance of people. But yes, thank you so much for that um, intro and for your thoughts there. Can I ask you the same question that I asked before? How did you feel? What did you think when you saw that police officer, Derek Chauvin, kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes? It, it really, it hurt me. Like, it genuinely had, like, a physical impact. Like, every single time I see a video, and they've all been resurfacing, like, all of a sudden, um, all these videos of police officers kneeling on people's necks and strangling them and beating them up. It literally just lifts all the hairs in my body and I actually feel disgusted. And I, it just, I have to sit back for a second and honestly just think about, like, what is society? Like, why is this a thing? I don't understand how there are different groups in this world. I do just believe it is the human race. And some person in history decided, okay, so we're going to make little groups and call them different races and some of them are going to be better than others and it just baffles me that the police think that they've got the authority to do whatever they want because they're backed by the government and that is just i just think the world is corrupt and we've got so many corrupt leaders that society and the people who are protesting what everyone's doing is the right thing because the people need to ultimately overthrow the people who are creating these laws which make it okay for police to stand on others necks and it I just felt sick to my stomach and when I saw it I just wanted to give every single like, black brother and sister that I know like a massive hug and just say I'm sorry that this is a world that you live in but you see that and you're like like that's just another day like that makes me feel sharp yeah that's what I thought yeah thank you for that um explanation and Amanda, Amanda Fitzgerald. I'm here, hello. 
Hi, hi Amanda. I want to thank you um, because you have really expressed yourself when it comes to a lot of situations to do with Black Lives Matter. You even made a panel of black uh, business friends that you know, and um, you got it advertised on various different black platforms. You included me on there, and I'd like to say thank you so much uh, for speaking out. You even made a video telling racist white people to go and fuck themselves. So I'd like to <laughs> say thank you very, very much for speaking up and uh, not staying silent. I, you know, Candy, thank you so much for inviting me here. Yeah, I am absolutely disgusted at, at, the, at everything that you black people have gone through, go through, and I really, really hope, I mean, this is the straw that broke the camel's back, I hope, you know, because Tyrell said and uh, Cheryl said, you know, oh my God, yet, yet again. I'm going to say, I'm white, you can see that, I was, and I also went to a private school we had very pe very few people of colour, but I love difference. I'm a xenophobe, you know, I love people of colour and all the rest of it. I'm attracted to speaking with, to people, where, and I love to ask where they come from. You know, someone might be black, might be from Africa. I've travelled to Kenya and to South Africa, and I've gone to, uh, you know, many different countries. And I just think everybody's got so much they can offer and educate everybody about. My point is... A, they can all fuck themselves, the white people. Um, that's number one, the people who are racist. But we white people, sometimes you will find that we actually are silent because we don't know what to say because we're going to put our foot in it. We don't know whether we're allowed to say, the, the, you know, whether we're allowed to call you black people. You know, literally, and you black people might think that's really weird of me saying that, but I'm white and I don't know whether, you're meant, whether I'm meant to call you people of colour or whatever. So for us, I think it's brilliant that I've got so many black friends and they're all educating me on how to say things and how to put it the right way so we don't cause offence. And I've seen quite a few of those placards saying silence is violence. And I actually agree. And that's why I'm really standing up now. And, you know, because I'm a PR person and I think, God, I want to do some PR for you black people. You bloody deserve it. And I really hope that now going forward, Something's going to change. Something big's going to change. We need to have more white people standing up. It's not just the black, black people saying, hey, hey, hey. It's going to be a lot le helping to lead this change, this movement, which you guys all need and deserve. And another point is, I want to rant on and say, I've got two children and I bought for my daughter Nina this amazing book called, um, uh, what's it called? Nighttime Stories for Rebel Girls. OK. And, you know, I never studied black history at school. And I think that should be on the curriculum. Maya, you can correct me. I don't know whether you study it now. You're 16. Is black history educated here in the UK? I don't know whether it's Absolutely on the curriculum. Absolutely not. That's one of the things which I also think is disgusting about the educational system. And I'm sure Cheryl also sees it, how whitewashed the education, like, educational system is. No one that comes from like African descent, no one learns about their history. I know none of my friends know about their ancestors. The only thing that we learn about, we learn about Battle of the Hastings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about mm -hmm. the liberation? Henry VIII and all that business. So what I was going to say, this amazing book, and it educated me, a, I'm going to be 50 next week. Um, so I bought it for my daughter about, let's say, five years ago or three years ago. And there's a story about Nina Simone, you know, when she was playing the piano, her recital for her family. And uh, her parents were very proudly sitting at the front of the church to listen to her beautiful, their beautiful daughter play the piano. And they were sent to the back because they were black. Yeah, sent to the back. And the rebel in Nina Simone said, I'm not going to I'm not going to play until my parents come to the front. That was number one. And that, that was I thought, wow, wow, wow. And that's why my daughter's called Nina. So, yeah. Uh, and then the other one was about Rosa Parks. Now, listen, I've, I have heard about Rosa Parks, but, you know, just reading about it again. Why don't we have the amazing stories from everybody in history taught to the British people or, you know, to, you know, worldwide. So we all know much more about your amazing history. It is outstanding, your history. And we need to know about it because we don't know. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. More black history should be taught in schools. Do you know what, Candy? Mm -hmm. yes, I saw something very interesting today. Um, it got sent to my phone and it's actually um, a message from somebody from 1835. I'm talking about the curriculum and black history, so I'm just going to read it very quickly. Yes, please do. 
I have travelled across the length and the breadth of Africa, and sorry for any mispronunciations as well, and I have not seen one person who is a beggar, who is a thief, such wealth I have seen in this country, such high moral values, such as people of such calibre, that I do not think we would ever conquer this country, unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is, their, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage, and therefore I propose that we replace her old and ancient education system, her culture, for if the Africans think that all, is, all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want them, a truly dominated nation. And that was from 1835, so yeah. they must have popped a big bottle of champagne because they're on their way to conquering that, that objective. We don't yeah. know anything about our heritage. And I was probably the last the last year of school that had humanities as a subject. I was the last year before they took that out. And then that was just solely learning about our rights. And they, we, after year seven, we didn't learn about that stuff. That whole subject was taken out of the system. So, but you don't, you don't think about them kind of things when you are in your youth. You don't understand the importance of it. But that's why I'm in empowerment, because I feel like that's the biggest ever thing for humans once you feel empowered to do something you're empowered to do anything and i feel that's what they've broken us feeling good about ourselves yes so, yeah and my, i have to agree with that they have definitely broken down black people to the point where some of us don't even know our history we don't even know anything much about our ancestors apart from slavery and yeah <laughs> they have managed to make us feel bad about ourselves and it's not every white person but obviously it's the white people who um, planned for this to happen and, you know, probably taught, you know, passed down that way of thinking to their generations and stuff like that. It's definitely a complete shame. And I thank you so much for reading that. Yeah, and that's all right. It, it was not coincidental that I saw it, actually. Everything I seem to be seeing in time for this meeting, that's quite good. No, brilliant. Um, right. I welcome it all, honestly. If anybody else has any um, short um sentences or clips or um quotes they can read out then please do so and amanda oh hey amanda number two <laughs> uh, thank you so Hi. much for joining us on the panel discussion today um i really appreciate you speaking uh with us i just wanted to know your thoughts really on how you felt when you saw that police officer Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. So, so many different thoughts, really. Um, and what one of the main ones I think that's kind of popped up over the, the last week is just kind of embarrassment for myself that it's taken this long for the white community to take like take responsibility there's no words for for injustice like that you know um and 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 it is it's ridiculous that it takes something it takes a man being murdered in public on video for for this for this revel like revolution to to be moving it, it shouldn't have taken this long um like everyone before has said like you know the the education in schools we 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 don't get educated on this everything is structured for our benefit whether we like it or not so it's not it's not a case of saying you know oh i'm i'm not racist i've got you know i've got black friends i've got um you know bipoc friends anything like that we have benefited from a system for generations from a system that benefits us and um, for, for me, anyway, I found this this week where I've I've been saying little bits, but not saying much in the sense that I've been waiting to sort of educate myself a little bit more. I made sure that I said something because, like you say, silence is so destructive. The same as you know, not voting. You know, people in power come in power because of a vast amount of people that are not choosing a side and by that they're choosing the side of oppression you know it's it's not a mistake that 
people like Trump are in power, Mm -hmm. people have made a choice not to take a stand. And I think, yeah, I think for me like I'm just I'm I'm feeling I'm feeling the guilt and I'm I'm sitting with it you know I've got lots of amazing friends of all races but you know I feel like not only have I benefited from white privilege but I've benefited from having amazing friends amazing black friends amazing again friends of all races but not taking the responsibility to to educate myself on the burden that they don't rightfully carry and you know and and that's not okay um and I'm I'm seeing a lot of people a lot of white people sort of reacting um to to, and judging on you know anger and things like that and I do a lot of studying on CPTSD um so so trauma um from from my own experience and it, it just kind of goes to show that people have, they harp on about mental health and, you know, caring about everyone, but there has been a very, very apparent, um, you know, it, I can see so widely how people are not trauma informed because they're not respecting people's pain, mm-hmm. you know, not respecting that, you know, this hasn't been, it isn't just something that's popped up it's something that's been going on for a very very long time and we have no right to tell people how to react how to feel to all of a sudden infiltrate um you know the people that are trying to teach us yeah. and and take up space when really we should be listening and and learning and taking what we listen and learn and sharing it in amongst you know in my case other other white people and you know it's 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 our duty to continually learn it's not going to be overnight it's it's going to have to be something that's continually worked on what you said about silence being destructive it's very true and i think that a lot of people who have been silenced over uh, certain racial experiences that they've gone through um they're now speaking about it. They're now being open about it. For example, the MC Lady Leisha, uh, she put a post up before I actually started this call. And she spoke about an experience that happened to her in Spain where she was just at a store and um, the security guard came up to her and called her, I think, a black bitch. And she then said, like, why are you calling me this? And all of a sudden he took her arm and put it behind her back and she got out of it. And then um, I think he kicked her in her stomach and slapped her around her face. And, um, you know, I think that, yeah, he then stopped her. They stopped her from boarding the plane back to the UK as well. And now obviously, you know, uh, to people who listen to... um, uh, grime and music so like two seconds. They don't know who Lady Leisha is, and you know she was she wasn't able to speak about what happened to her. And I think that it's this outrage now that's poured in from what happens to George Floyd. It is making people angry. It is making people share their experiences about being racially abused. And I think that it's something that you know, as unfortunate as it is, it needed to happen because even just holding those experiences in, it damages you mentally, you know? And when people are telling you, oh, you know, it's best that you don't speak about this or it might affect your career. It's like how, Let's go with, yeah, yeah. John Boyega. Yeah. It's like him, you know, he's gone to the protest, he's spoken openly and he said, fuck his career. It might be over, you know, because he's speaking out about things, but he doesn't care. He wants to stand for what's right. And I think that the more celebrities who do this, you know, the more people are not afraid to come out and say what they've got to say. Um, I know there's other celebrities in America as well, reality TV stars who are also standing on the front line at protest actors out there as well who are speaking out openly and you know, um, expressing how they feel about what's been going on. So that's also um, something that's, you know, that's something positive that's come from this. I think that unity is another thing that is, um, you know, that's had a positive effect on this. Everybody's coming together internationally, from London, America, 
you know, loads of different countries. I've even seen people in um, New Zealand. So I've even seen people in New Zealand doing ancient dances to support black power. And um, sorry, sorry, I thought someone was saying something. No, yes. I said it was the, the hacker dance, the New Zealand uh, yes. rugby players did the hacker. Yes, You're that's it, the globe is standing up. But you know, on your point quickly about the celebrities. Yeah. My view is, I'm John Boyega. I have nothing but 100% respect for him and what he had to say. The fact that as a young black man, he broke down in tears. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, his management team, who signed to Disney, right? They tweeted saying that they, he has their 100% support and respect. Yeah. Star Wars. Yeah, he's in Star Wars. Sorry, my son is just correcting me. So they've already said you've got our you've got our support. So for that, that's but my thing with the celebrities, every single footballer, black, white, or indifferent, every single celebrity, we're sitting down watching your movies, we're paying your wages. Yeah. You should all be standing up and saying something so that this doesn't happen again. Yeah. And for the footballers, refuse to play when they're throwing bananas at you on the pitch and you're speaking out and you're being ignored, now is the time to say, well, actually, we've been trying to tell you this for a hot minute. The mm -hmm. only thing you're interested in is how much money we make you, but we ain't playing none of your games, with or without an audience, until we see something change. The only way we're going to get change is by being what they will call radical. If that's what it takes, then no one steps a foot back in their workplace or anything until something is done, and it has to be done quickly, whether we're here in the UK or in America. A lot of people will say we can't afford to feed our kids. That's where we, you know, we keep talking about community and village. Mm -hmm. I have three freezers in my house filled with food. You say you ain't got no food, we'll come to your house and bring you something to eat. You and your children won't be starving. And this is the type of thing for those of us that aren't racist, for those of us that can afford to do so, we have to be that radical. Because imagine none of us go back to work tomorrow if we're working a nine to five. How this economy will shut down yeah. and the drivers, the hospitals, the this. Because nurses face the same discrimination and racism. You know, yeah. people in parliament face the same discrimination and racism. Yeah. Every single echelon of society, every single workplace, unfortunately, we're faced with racism and discrimination right down to the media. People yeah. like the Daily Fail who constantly are berating black people. Uh, they don't say anything positive. Even that guy on the breakfast TV in the morning all of a sudden has said, oh, if Madeleine McCann was black, I don't think she would have got the same mm -hmm. type of coverage. We know that. That's not new. Yeah. You, need you to tell us that. We've known mm -hmm. this for years. Anytime we as black people say something, you tell us we've got a chip on our shoulder. No, we don't have a chip on our shoulder. We've got two boulders and mountains on our shoulders because we're carrying the weight of your systematic oppression and we're sick of it. And anytime we speak about it, we say we've got a problem. We do have a problem. It's called racism. It's called discrimination. And it's called, you know, it's systematic. So unless the celebrities, those, of, those in the public eye, are using their platform to actually support, then what are you really doing in that position? Don't complain if we don't come and see your movie. White or black, use your position, use your power. You have millions of people following you and you're not doing anything. I'm not saying all, those of you that have done something, big up to that, but more needs to be got. I'm tired of this conversation. I'm bored, not this particular one, but I'm bored of this conversation. We've been having this conversation from since we've been in this country and nothing's changed. How many more black men, women, children need to be killed before everyone does something different and that goes right to the education system where they're destroying our young black boys and girls right to the workplace it's all way all the way along so when um as the sister the lady here said in the tiger print one of my favorites you know it's white people black people and the construct i'm 100 percent in agreement unless we collectively kick down these barriers and break down these doors and to be honest with you us as black people have been trying We've been trying for years. We've been trying politically. We've been trying economically. We can't get the same loans. We don't get the funding that is out there. They say we've got 10 million pounds of funding. When a black person applies, you're lucky if you get five grand. But yet we know our communities. We know our young people. We know what's going on, but it's not happening. But yet a white organization can go in, just put BAME in their funding application and they'll get 3.7 million pounds. And I'm being quite specific about that amount because I know it happens because I've witnessed it happen year in and year out. So these are the things that, unless these things systematically change, constructually change, 
we're going to have this conversation again next year. And whether we like it or not, for a lot of people within the Black and Asian community, like it or not, sometimes we need to count on white people in the, in the country who can stand in front of another white person who may be racist and say, well, actually, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. We're not going to have this. And if you don't change this, then us, we, us as white people are going to do this, this, this and this, and we're going to push for change on behalf of this I community. agree with you, Cheryl. And also, if you, I mean, I'm an addict to the news. I do PR, so I, I watch Channel 4 News all the time. And, um, you know, you have, I don't know whether he's still, you know, the head of the Metropolitan Police, the ra racist thing, you know, Trevor Phillips, you know, or the Football Association, the, the anti-racist, they're, they're all black people. Why not, why aren't there white people doing it? You know, and I'm not saying it's because they're going to get their voices heard, but they bloody will get their voices heard if you have white people heading up these, you know, these organizations which are trying to help out against racism i think that is you know maybe they need to have a, a black and a white person so they can both you know help educate each is? other do you know why that is what the, what i find and this is just my personal opinion and this is no disrespect to any organization that is black fronted whether they're from the government or whoever football what i find is there's a problem the easiest thing to do just like when they, when they want an interview on tv is call on a group of black people that they know throw them in a position with no resources, no real power, and say, right, okay, look, we've done something, we've put some black people there, they're fighting the campaign and the cause, but they know they have no power to change anything. There's no resources to change anything. And then it's just a bunch of black people in a position that does nothing, and then they feel that they fix the problem. When they know the problem is those that are attending those games. They know the problem is their colleague down the road who goes around calling one of their football players the N-word, or whatever it is. So they do this all the time. You know, that I've been called on many, many, you know, police chiefs, hotlines and gone to meetings. And it's all they want to do is hear what we've got to say as the solution. And then they're like, all right, like, thank you very much for coming. They've ticked that black box. They've yeah. ticked the Asian box. And then they do exactly the same thing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's what seems to happen year in and year out, which is why us as a community are still in the same place as we have been since we've been here. In fact, we've actually gone backwards. 75 years on, we've gone backwards from when we first came here and established ourselves. And that was with no bank loans because they still don't want to give us bank loans. That was with no funding because they still don't want to give us funding. And we managed to make it work. As soon as they systematically broke down our family structure and how we actually saved money amongst our community, that's when you see everything fall apart and what we're witnessing today with gun and knife crime, with regards to the disparity, just all the things across the board. Once we as a community take back this power, as well as getting the support that is needed out there, that's when we'll actually see change. Sorry, I was going on, but I'm just passionate and I'm just annoyed. No, I agree with everything you said. I think everybody listening will as well. And um, you can definitely tell that you're passionate about it. And I appreciate you for being honest and open because I think that is something else that it's going to take. More people like you who are not afraid to speak out, who are not afraid to tell the truth and say it as it is without fear of the backlash. And you are absolutely fearless. I mean, you gave up your job. You took on, you know, you started the Black Child Agenda as something that you do full time. Like you said, you are winning 99.9% .9 of cases. So I think that this really is a job for people like you, for emotionally strong people like yourself. And I have to salute you, to be honest. Um, and when you spoke about the celebrities, more celebrities needing to come to the forefront and, you know, saying more about it. One celebrity who I must say did an amazing job um, was Joe Quinn Phoenix. And he spoke out about this situation at the Oscars. I don't know if anybody remembers. Oh, yes. That. yes. And um, that is exactly what it's going to take. So I definitely agree with everything that you said there. Is there anybody else who um, wants to reply to what Cheryl's just said? With the call for celebrities and, and like I said before, is that even a protest? We have like a lack of leadership and it's like we need more leadership figures. But what I have to say is that rest in peace, Black the Ripper as well. There was an occasion where a celebrity has spoken out about their beliefs and they actually, it, the whole world operates over, over a fight for influence. And once you have influence, you become powerful because you have influence over people's actions and what they think and da 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 Now, somebody who has influence is, is communicating their opinions and that is a threat to somebody who's pushing a certain type of agenda and 
he's wound up mysteriously dead as a celebrity in which it's there's no cause of death yet to still be given to the people yeah i can see why there's not a mad incentive for people with beliefs to speak out but it will be a thing where if you actually see what's going on in the world and you don't agree with it you need to understand what you actually stand for because a man who stands for nothing will fall for anything so do you stand for your freedom or not so yeah there will there will be a fight it's not like it's going to come easy and and everything but we've had leaders that go down in history the Malcolm X, the Marcus Garvey's, the Rosa Parks yeah. they're there for a reason do you understand what I'm saying because they spoke out a lot of people don't want to speak out because they fear the repercussions why are we fearing a system it's an invisible threat it doesn't make sense yeah. so I think yeah they, I do understand why certain celebrities may have not spoken out because they have an influence meaning that they are actually players on the game which can endanger themselves but what do you stand for it's a thing of literally that down to your core what do you stand for is it the freedom of yourself and your people if it is then forget then death is going to be your calling if that's your calling but you need to stand up you need to because the way that we're heading now like we just heard it's not it's not going good it's not going well we need to stand up right now i I hear that but things are happening i don't understand how a man can mysteriously die after sharing his opinion well, I've heard quite a few rumours surrounding his death, but the last one I heard was that he'd had a heart attack. I also heard that he fell off a roof. Uh, I know that he died in the Caribbean island of Montserrat, so yeah. he wasn't here in the UK. Um, I think it's quite suspicious that a cause of death has not been given yet, but maybe that could be down to his family wanting to keep it personal. Who knows? But I'm sure that we'll get an explanation for it. But... um. Whether the explanation is true or not, uh, that's another story. Yeah, um, well, I know that George Floyd, um, something coming out about him, well, it's come out about him that he had coronavirus. Now, <laughs> yeah, I don't I know. know how true that is because obviously when you have coronavirus, you have problems breathing. So they're going... What does the officer have coronavirus now? Because um, he was within two metres. The officer better have corona now. Word. Yes, I, I do think the officer should be given a coronavirus test. Because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, but it just goes to show the things that can be made up to try to make people look less guilty. What um, the young man said, sorry, your names haven't come off, it's vanished off my screen. I agree with you. It's like everyone that speaks up in favour of the black community, civil rights or anything, ends up mysteriously dying. Um, See, the difference between um, one thing and another and those that are on the front line, so to speak, or the celebrities who can speak up now, them and myself with my small little self here, just doing the black child agenda, minding my business, I'm not afraid to die. That's the difference. I don't give a damn. I'm not scared to die. That's the one thing. I've prepared my children that if you see me get taken out, you know why. You understand? Mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not about to kill myself. I enjoy a good party. I enjoy a good drink. I enjoy a good smoke. So if I, was, if I died in a party or something, then you could probably understand I slip and broke my neck. But I'm not about to hang myself anytime soon because I'm depressed. I don't suffer with anything like that. So if that does happen because I'm fighting for something, that means that as a community and as a people, even more so, if you know someone's life could potentially be up under threat because they're speaking out against injustice that their face and their community is facing, then they're only being killed because that needs to be silenced. So that should make you even more determined to stand up and say something and do something. But the one thing I'm not scared of is death. I'll probably come back in another in another life, but I know the world can't manage two Cheryl Phoenixes at one time as it stands. So it's like that, for me, that's cool. And that's why with even with regards to my organization, we, we've set up a new one, which is literally standing up for the voices it's called one voice and i'm sorry for the quick promotion but it is for that yeah we're we're literally and it's like again right across the board people that are facing discrimination within the police force within the nhs within teachers i speak at the national union of teachers on a yearly basis for the black teachers network teachers are leaving the teaching profession in their droves because they see the discrimination amongst our children now if you have a group of young people who have been literally ripped apart by a system. They're, in you, they're with you 30 hours a week, every single day. By the time they get to 15, 16, 17, of course they're gonna be miserable. Of course they're gonna be bloody angry. Of course they're gonna be upset. Of course they're gonna be completely disengaged. 
And this is a systematic setup. So if you get them from as young as possible to hate themselves, everything they stand for, and even their view of the world, by the time they get to 16, 17 or 18, like the young man said, there's things that you're going to genuinely believe are not for you, are not accessible to you. And my sons were quite lucky because at the time when I was running my company, I gave them access to so much, eating in the finest restaurants, going to, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, being mentored by the top name barristers, traveling the world, because I could see they're young black men. I don't want them to be caught in a mental trap that they can't see themselves in a particular position, being a barrister, traveling the world, you know, conquering everything and don't let anyone tell you no. Not everyone has that opportunity. So, you know, we have to create that. And why is it that within the schools? Because remember, that's a lot of your foundation as a youngster is what determines sometimes how you're going to be as an adult, unless you've got someone around you that can speak to you and change that narrative. Why is it within state schools or these new private schools now? Because they're all private businesses. They're not teaching certain things on the national curriculum. They're not teaching business and economics. They're not teaching anything that will make a young person become a better human being. They're teaching you that you're only a slave. They're teaching you that white supremacy is okay, which they call the British Empire. You know, but they're not telling you what the British Empire did around the world. Why is that? Because they want a place of nothing but workers, people to go and get nothing but a job, which is just over broke. So you work for three, you get paid for three weeks, broke by the fourth, and then you go back into the system again. Why are they teaching that? Because you need to do that. Why are the prison systems in this country private, filled with the majority? We fill up what 25% of the prison population. Why is that? Because you stole a smarty, but yet you have a white male who has cocaine sniffs coat gets caught with it and he gets a slap on the wrist why is it black boys are being done and put in prison for weed but yet those in the hierarchical position who do have cocaine are not getting prison sentences at all do you understand what i'm saying so we have to look at the construct of this it's i know it's a mammoth thing but if, we're if these babies are being taught from so young coming up that's already sowing a seed in their mind that now parents are trying to um, pick at home with the few hours they get on an evening and a weekend then when they become adults now what you just go, the only thing that you think you're able or capable to do is what you've been told by the careers advisor. You probably didn't even pass our exams herself. I'm feeling that, what you just said. Wow, but I'm definitely going to be keeping a lookout for one voice. I think that the work that you do, Cheryl, is absolutely amazing. And that's why I was super excited to have you on the podcast today, because I know that you do so much within the black community and I hope that um, your works do come to light even more after this podcast and the right people, uh, you know, connect with you. You too, Tyrell, I know that you do a lot, especially, you know, with um, young black males and um, you're always doing things, you know, you're always encouraging empowerment. Um, you're two people that I must say are... A, a really positive force uh, for black people and um, it's been an absolute joy to have you on the podcast and you Maya as well I know that you've also got um, a mixed heritage background and um, I know it quite it could be quite difficult for you sometimes um, feeling like maybe piggy in the middle so to speak but um, you are very knowledgeable so I just want to say I just wanted to say that the reason that I feel the need to speak out so strongly is because, as you said, Cheryl, the fact that you need to have that conversation with your children, that, do you know what, if I speak out and I do end up mysteriously ha like hung, that's not me. The fact that you need to have that conversation, mm. and personally, I would never feel the need to do that. That is my white privilege shouting itself out to me. And just the fact that you need to say that is why everyone needs to educate themselves. Just the fact that even if you speak out in this day and age, you will be oppressed by some massive force and they will mysteriously cover up your death. So it is just a massive, huge, systematic problem that every single person, everyone in this planet needs to face because having that conversation should not be a thing. But yeah, thank you anyway. Definitely. I think that part that you said, Cheryl, about, you know, telling your children, if anything happens to me, you know, that's not me, you know. And you're right. I mean, you are right to actually tell your children that. So if anything does happen, which I pray that it doesn't, and I'm sure it won't, but um, 
I mean, that must be really difficult to actually say that to your children. And I'm sure that cases such as, you know, Sandra Bland's, it does make you think sometimes, you know, and it can even be a bit scary when you speak out as well, you know, along the same lines as what she did. So I definitely commend you for your work. You are very strong and brave. It's just work that has to be done because my thing is, if I wait for somebody else to do it, it will never happen. So I looked, what, how I started was that I looked at what was going on around me, even with young people hanging out on the street sometimes. We started a youth club. We said to the building people that were there, we're like, give us the, the, the building three hours a week. Let's have a youth club here because the kids are on the street. And I found myself kind of trying to judge, like, oh, my God, look at these kids. My children are so perfect. And I said, well, no, actually... Open up a youth club, do something on your doorstep. That's what I did. And then even doing the Black Child Agenda it was a case of, well, I see this going on. I can just go and run my company and go on five holidays a year and do all of these things. Or I can take the responsibility for our young people and actually do something different rather than complain about it. So that's what I did. So I made that conscious decision. But all the way through, I've also educated my children. And they have, you know, they got hotlines for anyone in any field because I've, I've positioned myself and my organization so that if they need support in X, Y, Z, A, B, C, they can pick up the phone. Um, but yeah, I, you know, for me, it, it's my responsibility as an adult. It's my responsibility as a parent and a member of the community. Any young person that like where we live could knock my door. They, they can't go hungry around here. They can't go without clothes. There's certain things that we just do that we used to do as an old school, particularly African Caribbeans. We know how we were raised. Why are we not living like that now? And mm -hmm. that's how I brought up my children. My sons can knock anyone's door around here and I know I don't need to worry from, from since they were young to this day. So I created my village where I live. And that's what we all need to do where we live is make sure that we have that foundation for all of our children and all of the kids around here, not one of them disrespectful. Good afternoon, auntie, how are you? Picking up bags, making sure, you know, and it don't matter what colour you are either, because I know there's this thing about the white-black thing. It is there, but I believe that racism is a systematic construct. Mm -hmm. And generally, most white people I meet, they could, they're cool. You understand? Mm -hmm. And they may or may not be feel that I'm cool too. But I will always unapologetically stand for what I believe in, stand for the black child agenda, primarily, not to say we don't deal with anyone else, because no one is standing for the black child and family. I can't name an organization in this country that stands for the black child and family. So if no one ain't doing it, then that means it's my responsibility to do it then. And I'm quite happy doing that too. Well, thank you. Well, my last question for everyone is, how do you all feel watching the police in the US um, mistreating the protesters? You know, some of them are spraying gas in their faces, some of them are driving past the protesters fast in the police car and opening the door and whacking them. Some of the police have even driven into crowds, yeah. beating people, just so many different methods of abuse. What do you all think about that? I'll ask Tyrell first, please. I think they want the Black Panthers to come back. Mm. If I'm honest with you, I don't know what's going on. Because I've, like you said, I've genuinely seen the abuse. Like some of these protesters, you aren't even actually retaliating or attacking or provoking any kind of hurt towards them, and police just walking past and just spraying their faces and stuff like that. I'm not sure because I've seen. I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but I've seen videos of of people reporting like bricks and stuff. I've, it's been reported that police, or not even police, but been leaving bricks in certain neighborhoods mm -hmm. coincidentally i'm not sure who it was i'm not going to put any blame but mm -hmm. bricks have been left and weapons have been left in certain neighborhoods as if they're inciting a right to start yeah. as if people are expecting black people to demonstrate their frustrations through rage and violence mm -hmm. where black people are finally starting to realize that they are better they are better than that it's starting it seems like a setup and mm -hmm. really and truly if you want to demonstrate and act on change there's a lot we're going to play the game we'll play the game and do it instead of just acting out of character and and letting them push whatever agendas they, i think they're expecting the worst from us so yeah. i feel like now we're starting to wake up and and actually protest peacefully i think i didn't i just encourage everyone to just if they're, if they're protesting know exactly what you're protesting for like what are you demanding to change and just stay peaceful don't give don't give any reason for them to to bring out the worst. I don't provoke anything worse to come out because 
at least if we know that we're not provoking any violence to come and then violence still comes, you can see that this system that is in place is really not for us. Because we haven't attacked first and they're still attacking us. There's a community, a community was in place and then the government came to govern the community. It's not, the government didn't come first, it was the community first. Mm -hmm. So if the community, if one's going to stay and it's not going to be the government that's going to stay, it'll be the community then, isn't it? Yeah. So I feel people need to just understand that we really do have the power. It's not, there's, it's invisible. Your, your threat is invisible. It's oppression. It's not a real person, understand? So yeah, no, nah, I feel like people just keep waking up and most importantly, I'm seeing... Cheryl's doing the, the talking of a, of a queen and stuff because at the end of the day, she knows yeah. information and content and her heritage and who she is. Yeah. A lot of us don't know who we are. That's why we're not talking like that. When yeah. you know who you are, boy, that's when you start, start talking and you know what you're passionate about and you're unstoppable. But if you have a nation of people like that, that's when it's game over, man. I feel like mm -hmm. all of us need to just lock down. How about we do lock down and educate ourselves and then come back out on, on some new stuff? Just ready, man, because, yeah. Yes, definitely. And Amanda Fitzgerald, you're, uh, you work, well, you know, you work alongside media. So how did that make you feel seeing the, you know, mistreatment that black protesters were going through by the police in the USA? Hideous. Exactly the same gross feeling I felt when I saw, you know, the, the knee on uh, George Floyd's neck. You know, it, it is gross, but I have also seen them attacking white people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, why the I mean, OK, I think it's Donald Trump who's bloody well instigated or, in, you know, said, come on, then you're all jerks. If you don't, you know, if you don't, you know, if we're going to, we're going to be like a war. They start looting, we start shooting. That's what he said, isn't it? Yeah, it's looting, all that business. So yes. I think he's got a lot to say. And, uh, and as Tyrell just said, you know, God, it's brilliant to be seeing these people now doing peaceful protests. Like there's a guy who's trying to get the, uh, the sign, the road sign off, um, you know, high up. He's, he climbed up a lampshade, what do you call it, a light thingy. And then they all told him off. They said, no, 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 get down, stop it. Let's do peaceful protests. They're trying to, you know, get the gates near the White House. <clears throat> and again, they're saying, shh, calm it down, calm it down. So that is, you know, that is the way that it should be. And I really hope and pray that that kind of that way. And then you're going to be rising above the bloody oppressors if you control it like that. I just quickly want to say a movie I saw. I don't know whether anybody else has seen it. I saw it about two years ago and it literally changed my life and opened my eyes so wide as a white person. And it was called The Hate You Give. Has anybody seen that? I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Okay, I, every, I, I said, you know. I think every white person needs to see that. I watched that movie and there's this kid driving, black guy with his black girlfriend or, you know, potentially they were going to become boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, the policeman stops him. I don't want to give you a spoiler, but let's just say he was grabbing a hairbrush. And he, anyway, it all ends out really disastrously. Um, and watching that movie, I did not, I don't know this racism that goes on, okay? I do not know because I live in a little village, you know, blah, blah, blah. But obviously I hear about it. But I think everybody should watch that because I literally watched that movie and I wanted to give a hug to every black person I saw in Asda, anywhere, thinking, I'm so sorry of what you have to go through. It's such an important movie. I don't know how we can get more people to watch it. I couldn't bear watch it, to be honest, because I thought, I'm going to get angry and I tend to get Maybe, yeah. upset when I see these things. It really disturbs me. Um, Cheryl, if I can ask you the same question, uh, how you feel because I'm sure you've seen all the abuse um, that the police are dishing out in the US to protesters. What's your thoughts on that? Um, just another day. This is standard stuff. You know, even the movie that um, you just mentioned, I don't personally watch those movies because they are, we, this is our everyday life. Yes, yeah, seeing, seeing the movies, the hate you give and others like that, you know, when we were slaves and all of these others, I personally don't watch them. It's the same old narrative we already we already know as black people. We've seen this. We're still living in the legacy of all of those things. Um, and even right now in 2020, my young black sons have to face that type of discrimination um, when they just come out of their house and go to the shop. So for us, it's not new. This is everyday life. And as a black person having to live with that. As a young black male having to live with that, and that's your norm. To think that as black people, this is our everyday norm. Um, you know, discriminated against in the workplace, just going to the shop, 
you know, look at the red coat she went to the shop to buy a bag for 5,000 pounds. What you spoke about, lady, in the uh, this is normal for us. And a lot of, I know a lot of white people say, well, why don't you react? Why don't you respond? It's like, but why? Because if we do, then we're accused of something else. And if we don't, it's like, well, how come you don't say anything? And it's like, to who? Who's listening to us? I don't care. They don't care. So for me, it's like, okay, we already know this. What I see going on in America, this is our lives. We already know this. Now what is where I'm at? I'm at, the, I'm at that point of, right, right. Now what are we going to do next next year? That's what I want to know. How are we going to do something different? And every movie that comes out of Hollywood, it seems to be something about slaves. It is about... Instead of bringing out yet another slave movie or yet another documentary about gun and knife crime, you know, or yet, you know, when Channel 4 contact me all the time, they do every year. Oh, uh, would you like to be part of our got documentary for gun and knife crime? Hell fucking no, I don't want to be part of your documentary for gun and knife crime. What I want to know is, are you going to do a documentary about the causes of knife crime? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to know. When you're ready to talk about the causes and what leads to it, then mm -hmm. give me a call. Until yeah, that then, I'm not works. interested. Why do I want to talk about what we already know, but no one wants to talk about the causes or solutions? Mm -hmm. If you want to do another documentary about the slave trade, why not go before that? Timbuktu, the first universities on this planet. Astronomy, um, and Tut uh, and Amun. the fact that Egyptians were as blacker than me, my dark skin, their hair was thick. When we're going to start actually talking about the reality of our lives and stop whitewashing our history mm -hmm. in your movies with your 20 billion pound budget, then we can start talking. So if you need sunscreen to go and do a black um, history project in Africa, that means that you weren't there in the first place. So let's stop lying to the public. Let's stop lying to our children and start telling the truth. And what I'll also say is black parents, you need to take the responsibility as well. You need to go to the library or wherever it is, go online. We're in the, we're in the advent of so much information. Find these black historic books. Find these black dolls, find these black facts and make sure your children are growing up with that narrative and stop blaming everybody else for your ignorance or your child's ignorance. Mm. There's no excuse anymore for anyone. We're in the age of information. Get online. You all have mobile phones now and go and find the books and go and find the research for your child. There's so many online learning resources right now while we're in the pandemic. Your children should be out here speaking about Malcolm, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Tutankhamun, you know, they should be able to recite all of that like in a heartbeat. Forget him, King Henry VIII, the man was a mass murderer. And this is what the British like to celebrate. So let's be realistic mm. with ourselves and actually do the right thing. So seeing that, no big deal. I've seen it all before. It's year in, year out thing. What I want to know is what we're going to do. That's a good question. Thank you so much for that, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Tyrell. Thank you, Amanda Fitzgerald and Amanda O'Hare. And thank you so much, Maya. I appreciate all of you joining me today for this discussion. And um, yes, I'm sure that hopefully something positive will come out from all this protesting and rioting and um, hoping for a turnaround towards racism. Thank you so much for joining me today on Candy's Conversations. Thank you. Hey, make sure you listen to my music, Prospect Living. Let's go. Hey. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, so, Candy asked me to share my opinion uh, about you know, the George Floyd murder. Um, I suppose because I am a police officer uh, and as well as being a mother to a mixed race uh, boy. So, um, it affects me from all sides. I'm not representing the police and I'm not representing white people, I'm just representing myself. Um, and my view on is on the murder is that it is absolutely uh, a murder um, and it's horrifying that it still happens uh, in today's world and that it was a police officer that did that. Um, and that he was doing that in the presence of other officers and no one did anything. That's just mind blowing to me. Um, and also when you look at his history, how long he's been doing this kind of stuff and nothing happened. Not only he didn't lose his job and he wasn't arrested and charged, um, but it was just brushed under the carpet. And this to me is just incomprehensible. Um, and it's absolutely wrong and um, you know, I'd say, I, I can't speak for 
US police by any means. Um, I work for the Met and although there is definitely racism present, especially unconscious bias, so the officers are not they're not even aware of, of the bias they have. And it's something we are working on and it's, it's challenging to push through the high ranks, but we'll get there. Um, and, you know, we definitely have come a long way uh, in the last 30, 40 years, but there is a still a long way to go. And I just want to, I suppose, reassure people that we're not, okay, I am not complacent. <laughs> and I don't think that the Met is all wonderful and absolutely non-racist. Um, I know that I have the biases. And for years I've been working on them uh, and still have to, you know, it's something that's so ingrained from your upbringing that it, it's challenging to be constantly aware of, of your thought process, but that's not an excuse not to do it. Um, and, you know, we, we all have to take part, we all have to uh, raise our awareness of what's going on in our heads and uh, make sure that we don't act on it. Um, so. I don't want to make this video too long. <laughs> um, so this is my piece. Um, it's wrong and I'm glad that um, there is a massive movement, uh, that it's, you know, becoming really big and really global um, because I'm hoping that this will shake people up and we can finally start making real changes that need to happen. Um, and make this world truly equal for everyone and it will take years but we've got to start somewhere so that's my piece <laughs>